G'day, I'm Ian Smith, and this is my 24-foot Ranger class gaff sloop new build. I need to start getting the fittings together for the deck and the rigging and so on. And a boat like this always looks best with bronze fittings. I'll be buying a few bits off the shelf. I'll be buying bronze winches, fuel and water filters, tracks and so on, mainly through classic boat supplies in Sydney. And I've already shown the through holes and the seacocks that I've installed. But many parts have to be custom made, like rudder fittings, chain plates, mast bands and goosenecks, etc. These can be reasonably cheap if you make the patterns yourself and have access to a good foundry. I'm a boat builder, not a pattern maker, but I've been doing this for decades on many different boats. And in this episode, I'm going to show you how I made the bronze castings for this boat, from pattern making to polishing. <music> Patterns can be made from any easily carved timber. I've used King Billy Pine, Hewan Pine, Jellyatong and others. Basically, you just make the shape of the piece you want in timber. Add radius fillets of epoxy or polyester filler. Get them really smooth and preferably paint them. But some patterns I've used before were cast without painting. In the past, we've used old fittings and recast them. These bronze floors under the engine beds of this elderly Sparkman and Stevens yacht were cast using the original galvanised steel floors as patterns. We just cleaned them up and replaced the rust damage with polyester filler. This other one we built up from plywood. The overriding consideration is that the foundry has to make a green sand mould of your pattern and the pattern has to be able to be removed from the sand without damaging it so the bronze can be poured in. The bronze casting shrinks a little when cooling, so make sure there's enough meat on your pattern anywhere that dimensions are critical. It's a lot easier to grind it off than it is to add it on. Now the simplest castings are ones like this rudder gudgeon, which can be made in just half of the flask. The flask being the box that they're cast in. The foundryman places the pattern on a board, places a four-sided box frame around it and packs moulding sand, which is sticky, almost like a clay, not like beach sand, up to the level of the frame and adds a lid, which then becomes the bottom of the box when he turns it over. He then removes the pattern. He'll usually then put a lid on with holes to pour the bronze and a riser or two for the air to leave and the molten bronze to rise up so he knows it's full. These rudder fittings can also be made in a similar, simple way. They all, that you just have to make sure they all taper so that they can be drawn from the mould. This whisker stay plate is also very simply made. The taper is called draft or draw because you have to be able to draw the pattern out of the sand mould without damaging it. Check it with a square and each vertical surface should taper away from the square. The gap should be at the top, so that once turned over, you can draw the pattern out of the mould. Even these small vertical surfaces should have some draw or draft. The split moulds have to taper away from the centre line where the, where the split is. In other words, they're tapering that way and that way, away from the parting line. The first half is laid on a flat board, which is the lid of the box. Then they pack the moulding sand around it. They turn it over. That will be sitting with sand up to that level. Then they use the locators to make sure that the mould, make sure that the pattern fits together. Then remembering the sand is exactly up to the parting line at that point. They use a separating agent, of course, but then pack more sand down around that. They then separate the two halves of the casting box, the coat and the flask. They then draw the patterns out of the holes, add their flues and risers and the various other things they need to do for pouring. 
close the box up again and they've got a hollow which is the exact shape of that which they then proceed to fill with bronze. It gets a little more complicated when you have to make fittings that are hollow because you need to make a core up for the part that represents where the timber will go into it. So when the casting comes out, it's hollow. This is a bowsprit end cap or, or crantz iron, crantz bronze, that uh, is capped. Now, this is something that we do a fair bit of around uh, around Sydney, capping the uh, masthead and, and uh, bowsprit caps. But uh, it's not often done elsewhere, I gather. The, they mostly reveal the wood right through at the end. Anyway, that one's done with core B, which is made in a, in a core box. They pack the sand in that and use the sand to fill this spot. I turned the core up in two halves, then cast this in plaster of Paris. I placed the first half face down and surrounded it with a box frame and poured in plaster of Paris, then put a base on it. I applied Vaseline as a release agent on all exposed surfaces. Then I placed the second half on top, locating it with the pins fitted. Then I made up a box frame and poured plaster of Paris into the frame. Later, the two halves easily separated and I've got a completed core box into which the foundry will pack sand to make the core that when placed in the mould will make sure that the cap fitting is hollow. Some very simple patterns can be made without splitting the pattern. But you must remember that it means a little bit less work for you, but a fair bit more work for the foundries. Uh, these fittings need to be tapered away from the centre line. They're going to be pressed into sand or holes dug with, with some simple tool to push this in and pressed around up to that halfway line. Then the other half of the flask is added on top. Same with this one, but pressed into a, a carved slot, a dugout slot, packed up to halfway, more sand added on top. Same with this pad eye fitting. This is actually a bronze fitting that we've added a little bit of material to to make sure there is draw or taper away from away from the centre line. The biggest one of this type is the horse for the stern for the main sheet. I took the whole bunch of patterns to the foundry, central foundry at Mascot, where I've been going for 40 years, although 40 years ago they were at another side up the road. A few weeks later, I picked up a whole bunch of lovely castings. Now, they all need some level of finishing. There may be a few irregularities at the locations of the sprues and risers that the foundry cut off, and sometimes the taper you built into the patterns has to be ground down. This is the case with the chain plates, because both sides, particularly the inside of the curve, have to be fairly flat to bear firmly against the back of the stringers in the boat and to sit tight on their timber packers. So I had to grind off a bit of bronze to flatten them, constantly checking as I went. The tops of the chain plates also needed a bit of grinding to bring them down to the thickness needed to fit the toggles of the rigging screws. A linisher is pretty indispensable for finishing the castings. This one is an attachment I recently bought that still fits my 30 year old bench grinder. If you're doing this all the time, you'd obviously need a larger dedicated linisher, but this one's fine for the amount of work I'll give it. I started off with 80 grit belts. This is the first time I've polished bronze for about 15 years. <laughs> 
Since then, I've used a local guy that worked relatively cheaply and did a fabulous job, but his business didn't survive COVID and he's now doing something else. You'll notice I'm wearing leather gloves because the metal gets pretty hot. You've got to be careful to keep your hands away from the belts. If you smell burning hide and you don't feel it, it's probably the gloves. If you do feel it, it's you burning. The detail work around the top of the chain plates is a bit more involved. I started with 80 grit discs, then went to shaped stone grinders in the fillets. But at this stage, it's time to drill the holes. I slid each chain plate into its place on the boat and marked where I needed to drill the holes, then drilled them on the bench drill. Then I carefully marked the positions for the holes for the rigging attachments in the tops of the chain plates and drilled those. It's not shown here, but I eased the edges of each drill hole with a larger drill bit. Then it was back to the linisher with finer belts, firstly with 150 grit and then 240 grit. At every level, the object is to remove the marks left by the previous belt or disc. The outsides of the chain plates and the areas hidden behind the stringer didn't need any finer work than the 80 grit linishing belt. At the top end, I used flap sanders in a drill. Roll of discs in an air tool. Then these fibre brushes which get right into the corners. You'll often have to go back to an earlier grade to get rid of some marks that have survived the finer grades. Then I used two grades of scourer pads on roll off discs. And by this stage, these detailed areas are ready for buffing. If you don't have a linisher, or even if you do, standard sanding discs on a rotary orbital sander will do a great job on larger areas. I used 150 grit and then 240 grit. You could go finer, but I found this was close enough to allow the scourer type linishing belt to remove the scratches. Final polishing was done on the buffing wheel, a cloth wheel used with an application of buffing compound, sometimes called soap. Take your time, the wheel needs to be in contact with the surface for a while to really begin to make it shine. Sometimes previous scratches will show up and you may need to go back to a previous level of sanding or scouring. This store-bought fitting, my fuel filler, has a lovely polish on the visible surfaces, but it shows that you don't need to polish unseen surfaces. I haven't polished any of the other castings yet, but I'll just show you some of the mast fittings I made several years ago when I started this project. This is the boom band and gooseneck fitting. This is the spreader band. And this is the masthead cap, all ready to go, but covered in dust at the moment. You might notice that I've done a bit more work on the cockpit and the back of the cabin. And this will be the subject of episode 19. Have a look at the other videos on the Smithy's Boatshed channel on YouTube. Thanks for watching.